you, Stuart. Okay, let's go ahead and pull out these notes. Now, just so you know, we're not going to cover six pages of notes tonight. But uh, this is such an important topic. And there's a percentage of you that really want the biblical rationale for the points I'm going to make. I'm going to make some broad strokes points. But some of you say, I need Bible verses. Others well, you're easy. Or you go, hey, I believe the points. They sound right. So I'm giving the larger set of notes for the folks that just got to know why you can say these various things. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And we just ask you, even now, Lord, touch our heart in a new way. Come and stir us. Come and awaken us to what's on your heart concerning your great end time plan in the Middle East. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the reason I'm talking on this the last couple of weeks is because the hostility in Israel is escalating so rapidly on a global level. The Bible said it would. And it's escalating rapidly, and it's going to continue to escalate even more rapidly. And most of the church that I've interacted with they're biblically illiterate about what's going to happen. And I'm not saying that mean. I'm saying they'll be caught deer in the headlights, confused, and instead of clear and taking a bold stand. Most of the church has grown up. I, I My first years, I don't really do that Israel thing. And I didn't realize how central it is to God's end-time global purposes and end-time revival and the coming of Jesus. I'm going to start, I'm just going to make some broad stroke points here again and leave you to read the notes on your own. Paragraph A, Isaiah, when I say Isaiah 19, that's code for Isaiah 19 verse 24. Like I tell a lot of folks, yeah, we're really doing Isaiah 19. I really mean verse 24. Although I believe I've studied the whole 25 verses and they're very important, but verse 24 is what I typically mean. And that means the unity of Arab, Egyptian, and Jewish believers in the Middle East in a way that shocks the whole earth. That's what Isaiah 19 verse 24 is saying when you read it in context to the whole biblical narrative about the end times. Paragraph A, Isaiah 19 verse 24 describes... The greatest international social miracle in human history. Big statement. The descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, and their, I'm talking about their descendants. Three, four thousand years later, they're going to, they're in great hostility. They have been for four thousand years. They're going to come into a profound unity that's going to shock the earth. It says in Isaiah 19, verse 24, and you might not catch it at the first read. It says, verse 24, in that day, related to the coming of the Lord, Israel, now this is a simple way of saying it, but it's profound in its implications, will be one, will be unified. There'll be three of them that are in unity. Israel, their arch enemies, Egypt, and Assyria. Now in Isaiah's day, Assyria was the superpower of the world. Assyria, ancient Assyria, was the largest empire up into that time in history, is in the territory of at least 14 Middle East countries today. So when Isaiah said Assyria, it was one big empire, 2,700 years later, which is now, it includes those 14 Middle East nations, which are all Islamic nations, by the way. So let me read it again. Israel is going to be unified, one, with Egypt, and at least 14 believers from 1,400, I mean, 14 Middle East nations. John chapter 17. This is, I believe, the heart of this is what Jesus, I mean, the heart of what Jesus prayed for is related to this Middle East miracle. Now, we've, 
kind of got used to reading John 17, and I, I don't mind this, I really don't, so it sounds like I'm putting it down in a big way, I'm not, but we've got used to dumbing down I, 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 John 17 so low that it doesn't mean very much besides ministries in different denominations working together for the Billy Graham outreach in the city. And that's kind of been over the years. Well, there you go. We're, we're doing John 17. The world's going to know. But when you read John 17, Jesus said human beings are going to be as unified as the Father and the Son. Like, excuse me? And I'm going to pour out glory. But look at verse 23. The earth. We're talking about now the millennial earth. The earth. All the nations. Hundreds of millions of people. Billions eventually are going to know that the God of Israel sent Jesus. The whole earth is going to know it when this unity happens. Now this John 17 unity is not limited to the Middle East, but the Middle East is the epicenter. It's the drama where the most intense hostility in human history is going to come to the place of deepest humility and family spirit, and the earth is going to be shocked. They're going to say, surely the God of Israel planned it from the beginning, and he has authority over all history. Look at this remarkable plan. The miracle of unity occurring through the Middle East will happen in context of Jesus' return. Now, paragraph two under here, we know about the 150 chapters of which the primary subject is the generation the Lord returns. These 150 chapters provide much information to this global drama. Meaning if all you have is Isaiah 19 verse 24, you won't get it. But when you read Isaiah verse 20, 19, verse 24, in context to the broad strokes storyline throughout the Old Testament prophets, it's clear what's going on here. And then you got Jesus in John 17 praying it. And he's really praying Jews and Gentiles. And the Gentiles he's really talking about are Arabs and Egyptians. Of course, it involves all of us. I don't limit it to that. But that's the most intense hostility. The earth is going to be shaken when it comes to profound unity. Paragraph B, we know that the dramatic biblical storyline is there's going to be an outpouring of glory and an outpouring of darkness happening simultaneous. We all know that. All the nations are going to be shaken. we got to get clear about this. We're kind of hoping it won't happen, but it's going to happen. But here's the good news, Haggai, Haggai 2. They, the nations, are going to come to Jesus when the nations are shaken. They will come to the desire of all nations. That's one of my favorite titles of the Messiah in the Old Testament. He's called the one the nations desire. So when the nations are shaken, many will be offended, but many will be awakened, and they will be awakened to the desire of the beauty of Jesus. Paragraph C. So that you're not confused or intimidated, I'm, set, I'm uh, uh, putting out here four different common interpretations. So you don't, I don't, my prayer is that you're not confused or intimidated by the three that are not the biblical narrative. The biblical narrative, great revival and great pressure. There's a hundred ways to say that. Many people say only the revival and they minimize the pressure. That's not the biblical narrative. Don't be tricked by that or intimidated. Others go the other direction. Only the trouble. They don't see it in time revival. Worse than both of those is number four. They go, this was all fulfilled in 70 AD and it's symbolic in a way it didn't really matter. I want to assure you the greatest outpouring of power of the Holy Spirit and the greatest darkness will happen simultaneously. And in this context, the great harvest, the victorious church, the church becomes the prepared bride. The national salvation of Israel and Egypt are the first two nations with national salvation. And then the earth is filled with the glory of God in this context. And it's all been laid out in the prophets. Top of page two. The Lord's end time plan includes the national salvation of Israel. There's a number of verses. But also the national salvation of Egypt. Egypt see, is uh, highlighted more than any other Gentile nation in the Bible. 
And Isaiah 19 talks about that. Verse 21, the Egyptians will know the Lord. Wow, that's, I'm talking about, and there's a bit more on, on, on this subject in the Bible. And this strange idea that Isaiah is, is the one who emphasized, there's going to be a highway, a literal highway from Egypt to Assyria. Now remember, Assyria, the territory of Assyria, ancient Assyria, is 14 Middle East nations today. Now, I don't know how that highway works. But there's going to be a highway in context to the return of the Lord. And the Egyptians are going to serve the believers and even the, the, the uh, national agenda of the Lord in these other 14 nations. And it could be a couple more nations because the uh, ancient Assyria, you know, it, it was big, then small, then big, then small a couple times. And so it's about 12 to 15 nations today represented. They're going to serve each other and they're going to come to a profound unity. And the Lord says in that unity, when those three are one together, this is so understated by Isaiah. Of course, the Spirit's leading him. It will be a blessing in the midst of the earth. Like, excuse me. It will be a blessing in the midst of the earth. It says the word land, but you could put land or earth. It's the same Hebrew word. But actually, it's the land of Assyria is Iraq, Iran. I mean, take Iraq, the Euphrates River, and the Nile River in Egypt. That's the original boundaries of the Garden of Eden or of the land that God promised Abraham from the Euphrates River, Iraq, to Egypt, the Nile River. That's the original boundary lines that God promised Israel. And I believe that's the original boundary lines of the Garden of Eden. And what's going to happen is God's going to heal the family of Abraham in that area and that is going to be the restored Garden of Eden that's going to fill the millennial earth. That's my, that's my conviction. The Bible's clear, paragraph F. Jesus is going to restore the agriculture, the atmosphere, the animal life to the conditions of the Garden of Eden. And it's that land from the Nile River to the Euphrates River, Egypt to Iraq and Israel... That land will be the epicenter, and it will progressively, the Garden of Eden blessing, will progressively spread out throughout the millennial earth and fill the whole earth with the glory of God throughout the thousand-year reign of the Lord. Paragraph G. Now, there's a bit of conversation today, which I love, about the highway. Some of you are familiar with it. I've been on a number of Zoom calls in the last year. Uh, with uh, people on the Isaiah 19 highway. I love it. But mostly when the highway is talked about today, it's talked about as a relational highway of believers today. And I love that. I think that's real. That's very important. But the highway is more than a relational highway in this age. And, and, I, and, and I think it's very important that we lean into that relational highway. There's believers, I mean thousands of believers in Iran, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Egypt, Israel that are starting to become, well, they have been for some years, but more and more deep friendships. And this is a precursor to the great revival that's coming. I mean, this is the hand of the Lord doing this. So I don't want to minimize that, but at the same time, I don't want us to lose what Isaiah says when he talks about this highway. He actually, I have it written here, you can read it later, he actually mentions it directly seven times and indirectly three times. Ten times he talks about this highway, meaning this is a major subject in the biblical the biblical narrative of the end times, this highway. I'm not going to go into it right now, but I'm excited by this because there's not that many things in the biblical storyline that are mentioned ten times. You know, when it talks about every eye will see Jesus, that's only mentioned three times. When it talks about the great trumpet, you know, God's trumpet will blast everyone will hear it, that's only mentioned five times. The highway is mentioned ten times. I mean, this is pretty significant when something is mentioned that many times. Paragraph H, I just gave you a little bit to look at for some of you that say, yeah, give me a little bit more on that. And we'll develop this in some other, some other time, but that's not my point tonight. Paragraph I, 
The basic premise in the Middle East is this. Paul said it clearly in Romans chapter 11. He said Israel is going to be provoked to jealousy by Gentile believers. Now we we have the verse there, Romans 11, verse 11. What does it mean Israel provoked to jealousy? What it means is to godly jealousy, Israel is going to want to have experiences with the power and love of God they see in Gentiles. They're going to look at Gentiles under the anointing of the end time revival and go, wait, we want that. That was our guys in the Old Testament did that. Elijah, Moses, wait, that's our stuff. And God says, that's right. I'm going to stir you up and say, I gave the Gentiles that which is yours to make you jealous in a godly way to where you want it. And God's going to use the Gentiles in the earth, actually, not just in the Middle East, but in the Middle East, I mean, it will get so intense that Arab and Egyptian believers being loyal to God's purpose in Israel, literally at the threat of their life. It, it will be costly. Many will lose their life in their loyalty to Jesus, taking a stand for unbelieving Israel. But unbelieving Israel will be shocked and awakened and the love of the God of Israel will be revealed to them by those believers in the Middle East. Now, again, not only Middle East. We're all in this together. But it will be up close and personal there in a way that will be very costly to human life for Arab and Egyptian believers and Persian believers. and all, I mean, just the whole bit. There's a number of different nationalities. When they say, we love Jesus so much... We're going to stand with you because we're going to reveal the love of Jesus, the God of Israel, to you, unbelieving Israel. And unbelieving Israel say, what? What? Wait, you guys are Christians. You don't like us, remember? Don't you remember history? You're against us. No. No, that was false. That was the spirit of the Antichrist moving through people who claim to be Christians. Israel's going to be provoked to godly jealousy. Israel's national salvation, that's another premise here in paragraph I, is connected, catch this, you can read it right there, verse 25, to the fullness of the Gentiles. Meaning Israel's going to come into national salvation when the fullness of the Gentiles. That means the full number of Gentiles. That means the full power of the Spirit on the Gentiles, the great end time revival. That means spiritual depth, the full depth of maturity of love. There's going to be a witness of Gentiles born again on fire under the power of the Spirit, deep in love, called the fullness of the Gentiles. And Israel is going to witness it up close and personal. And it's going to shock them and awaken them. And it's going to actually lead to their national salvation. And God wants their national salvation to be connected to the Gentiles standing in the gap for them. It's a remarkable plan. Look at verse 31. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago. Romans chapter 11, verse 31. Paul says, catch this. And I don't think we catch this. I mean, you, it's easy to miss. He goes, Israel's disobedient. They have been, you know, the 2,000 years. But through the mercy shown to Gentile believers, Israel's going to get awakened to salvation. But it's through the mercy God's going to put on Gentiles. The Gentiles have this incredible privileged position. Some might call it a responsibility, and they may be weighed down. They go, what a responsibility. I go, well, it is a responsibility. But for the Genesis 1 God, Yeshua, Jesus, to say, Gentiles, would you partner with me to awakening Israel and the benefit and privilege of that? You will rejoice for billions of years that I let you be a part of that. I mean, it's a glorious reality. It will be costly, but it's only costly for a very short time. But the glory of it will be remembered for billions of years forever. What an honor that God is going to reveal mercy to Israel through the fullness of the Gentiles who are going to be the conduit of mercy to the nation of Israel. Paul says in verse 33, we looked at this the other day, Oh, the depths of the riches. Who would have thought of a plan like that? Who would have thought 
that Israel would be in unbelief predominantly, but awakened through godly, humble, self-sacrificing love of Gentiles who are so grateful to Jesus because he saved them. They want to be a conduit of blessing and mercy because of their gratitude and their humility. And God says, and the whole earth will see my family restored. Oh, the depths of God's plan. Matter of fact, he says, this plan is so unusual that it's unsearchable. Nobody could figure this out without the revelation of the word and the spirit. No mind could have put this together. His ways, his plan is past finding out by human log logic without divine revelation of the word and the spirit. But beloved, we have the word in the spirit. And there's all kinds of clear, clear statements in the broad strokes plan. And I'm going, Lord, who would have guessed? Who would have thought? This is marvelous. And the Lord says, yes, it's my family plan. I'm going to restore a family through this. And the earth is going to be filled with gratitude and awe at the family of God when this all unfolds. Top of page three. Well, let's get down to some more of the nitty-gritty now. Well, I don't know about nitty-gritty, but some of the details that Jesus highlighted. Matthew chapter 24. Most of you know that that's the, the chapter where he talks Jesus more on the end times than any other place in the Bible. Matthew 24. He says in verse 15, it's very important that you get verse 15 to 21, 22. He says, when you see the abomination of desolation. He goes, I mean the one that Daniel prophesied in Daniel 11 and 12. It's really clear. He prophesied about the abomination of desolation in his final vision, Daniel 11 and 12. He goes, when you see it, and that is the image of the beast standing in the holy place in the temple, in the restored temple. When the Antichrist puts his image in the Jerusalem temple that isn't even built yet, but it's going to be. When that happens, he goes, and let those who read understand. He goes, read Daniel's, his final vision, Daniel 11 and 12. It's clear the Antichrist is going to put an image of himself in the temple, the mark of the beast. That's all connected, one big reality. When that happens... Verse 16, Jesus said, Oh, my beloved Jewish brothers and sisters, if you live in Judea, the whole region, not just Jerusalem, the whole region, flee now. Because when the Antichrist puts his image in the temple, the image of the beast, the mark of the beast, Revelation 13, I got a little bit on the notes. Most of you are familiar with it. When he does that, he's pulling his mask off that day. He is no longer showing himself as a, in a false way, as a man of peace, but he's going to show himself as the man of war that he is. And he will have his security forces around the nation when he was masquerading as a man of peace. And when he pulls that mask off and he steps in that Jerusalem temple, he is then fully functioning as the evil man of sin. He's going to lock the nation down right away because there'll be security forces all around they all have it clear. And Jesus says, don't even go back to your house to pack your bag. Take off now. Because there will be a lockdown within the hour or two or three or whatever. Flee. He's talking to Jewish people in the whole region of Judea. Now, a lot of Jewish people won't flee because they don't believe Jesus. But he's, he's giving us insight to the urgency. And again, it's the security forces. This is my read of it. And there will be an a instantaneous, near instantaneous national lockdown of the borders because the Antichrist wants to exterminate the Jewish people. He's going to lock them in and the nation is going to be like a prison. He's going to shut the doors on them. So they will be fleeing with far greater urgency than they did in Nazi Germany even. Because it will be, the, the, the evil will be uh, uh, clear very soon afterwards. Some will take off by their automobile. Their car, however much gas they have, is they're not going to get any refills at any gas stations. The shutdown will be immediately. Others will take off by foot. Others by bicycle. Maybe some by boats. I, I don't know. They're going to take off. But there's only one problem. When you run out of Israel because of your fleeing the Antichrist, you're surrounded by Islamic nations that hate you almost like the Antichrist does. 
They're running from the Antichrist to Islamic nations. That's intense. I'll get to that point in a second. I thought I was right there. So what happens? Look at this. We're going back to paragraph A. Jesus said, when that takes happen, verse 21, it will be the greatest time of tribulation in human history. Unless those days were shortened, they're shortened to 42 months, three and a half years. If those days lasted longer than 42 months, no flesh would be saved. He's talking about physically surviving. He's not talking about nobody will be born again. He's not talking about salvation like that. He says no human would survive if this thing went on and on. The whole human race would be killed. In other words, that is a, when you read verse 22, well, verse 21, the greatest tribulation ever, we go, yeah, we're kind of used to that. Verse 22, Jesus puts it into real language. We go, what are we talking about here? I mean, this is so surreal. None of us can even relate to it. Like, no human would survive. Paragraph B. Well, you go to that vision of Daniel 11 and 12. It's one vision, Daniel's final vision. It's the abomination of desolation vision. Again, the abomination of desolation is simply, he puts the, I mean, it's more than this, but the core of it, he puts his image of the beast in the Jerusalem temple, creates the mark of the beast economic system that's global, actually. It becomes global very quickly. Verse 31 of Daniel 11, the Antichrist shall place there His image is the idea. In that temple, it's called the abomination of desolation. Because it's the, it's the, the most grievous abomination in human history that leads to desolation of millions of people. That's why it's called that. It's the most grievous, the darkest abomination in human history. And it will lead to the desolation of many people. Therefore, the name abomination of desolation. It's a bit of a cryptic name until you see it. And it's really actually quite straightforward. Well, the good news, verse 32 of Daniel 11, the people who know God will be operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. So don't forget that part. Don't get so lost in the negative. You don't see the positive, but don't get so caught up in the positive. You don't see the negative. Verse 41, the Antichrist is going to enter into the land of Israel. More than that, verse 45, he's going to set up his palace near Jerusalem. He's going to put his palace near Jerusalem, the Antichrist, in the land of Israel. A lot of folks don't like that. I don't like it either. I don't get to vote. The very next verse, Daniel 12, verse 1, the mighty angel tells Daniel this will be the greatest time in history. That's the very verse Jesus quotes when he talks about the great tribulation. He quotes this verse here in Daniel 12, verse 1. We just read it in Matthew 24. Jesus said, it'll be the great tribulation. He's actually quoting Daniel 12, verse 1. That one, one of the uh, 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 truths that is in Daniel's final vision. This will be so intense when the Antichrist puts his palace in Israel, just outside of Jerusalem. Look what happens. I want you to catch the sense of the carnage. I'm not trying to be morbid. <clears throat> but I want to be faithful to the word of God. Because this stuff is so politically incorrect. Nobody wants to talk about it. And the few that do talk about it have us raptured so it's never personal to us. So it's just kind of interesting. You know, we'll make good movies about it or something. Because we're not going to be here anyway. But I want to tell you, the body of Christ will be here. And this will be intense. But the power of God will be on the church. But it will be an intense time. And the reason this matters, because I believe that we're in the early days of that generation leading up and these events will happen. I believe in the lifetime of people that are alive right now. Maybe it's the two-year-olds. Maybe it's the 20-year-olds. Maybe it's my age. I don't know. I believe there's people alive on the earth that will see the fullness of this in their day. This is a, I mean, there's so much information on this on the Bible. Again, it's so politically incorrect that just nobody wants to talk about it and us be here. If we're raptured, then it's okay to talk about it, make a chart on it, make a movie on it. It's kind of cool because it's not personal. But when it's personal, we don't really want to face it. 
But again, it's the power of God will be poured out like no time ever. It says in Revelation 9, paragraph 1, a third of the Gentiles in the earth will be killed. A third. Two billion? Three billion? I don't know the number, but what? It says in paragraph 2, Zechariah 13, a two-thirds of Israel will die. Well, it's two-thirds of Israel. You know, they say there's about 18 to 20 million Jews today, depending on how you count. Two-thirds of 18 million would be 12 million. Again, there's no actual number, but two-thirds, one-third of Gentiles would be two, three billion. The number of Gentiles is so much surpassing. The reason I say that is because when, when over the years as I've talked about this, people go, oh, that's so negative about Israel. I go, have you read the Gentile part of this yet? I go, this isn't against Israel. This is against darkness on the human, uh, on the planet. It's far more Gentiles will be troubled by this than Jews. But the believers that are Gentiles are going to be troubled as Gentiles and then stand for the Jews as well. But the Lord says, yeah, but I'm your bridegroom king and I am the resurrection. You have nothing to fear. I like what he says in Matthew 10. He said, even if they kill you, you won't lose one hair from your head. I go, how's that work? He goes, don't worry. Billions of years, you'll be happy as can be. Every single hair will be replaced. They kill you, Matthew 10. You won't lose one piece of hair from your head. Jesus means it. But it, it is real, though. It's really, really, really awesome. Paragraph C, <clears throat> the subject of Christians and Jews enduring captivity is a key theme in end time prophecy. It's the most neglected theme, but it, there's so many references to it. I want to say it's very sober. It's very troubling. In the flesh, I don't like it. Let me say it again. The subject of Christians and Jews enduring captivity, talking about prison and many death, is a sober reality in the biblical narrative of the end times. The body of Christ, we're the only ones who have been informed ahead of time because we believe the Bible. And we understand the glory on the other side of it, and we understand the privilege of, it, of this reality of standing with he who is the resurrection. So we won't be taken back and surprised and shocked. We will grasp it, although I still think there'll be a shock factor. Number one, the New Testament puts the emphasis on the Christians who are martyred and imprisoned. The Old Testament puts it on the Jews. I appreciate that. I go, Lord, the New Testament, we don't have the Old Testament passages. God says, no, I'll make the Jewish prophets responsible for that message. I mean, we still say it, but it came out of the mouths of Jews, not Gentile apostles. Paragraph 2. Zechariah, and they killed him. He said half the city will go into captivity, half the city of Jerusalem. This is actual. The city of Jerusalem has 600,000 Jews in it right now. If half the city of these numbers, I don't know what the numbers will be in 10, 20, 34, I don't know what the years, that would be 300,000 going into captivity. This is not a small thing. Meaning this isn't the sort of thing the body of Christ can look at and say, well, I'm not really into that. Like, yeah, yeah, we, we really got to start thinking about this. This is actually real. Top of page four. The Old Testament has a lot more verses about the Jews in persecution and captivity than the New Testament has the Christians. The New Testament has plenty. <laughs> There's plenty in the New Testament, but the Old Testament has actually more. Paragraph E. Here's the verse I was thinking of a few minutes ago. The day of the Lord, Amos says, what good is the day of the Lord? He's talking to unbelieving Israelites. He goes, for you, the day of the Lord, and there's several days of the Lord through history, but this is talking about the ultimate day of the Lord. 
The ultimate day of the Lord is the one when Jesus returns. There's lesser days of the Lord, a few of them through history. Not so many, but a few in the prophets. But the ultimate day of the Lord, he goes, it will be for you, if you're living in rebellion against God, like a man running from a lion and you run into a bear. They go, oh, there's a lion. And you run straight into a bear. You're running out of Israel from the Antichrist and you run into Islamic nations that hate you. I mean, that is a dilemma. But there's good news. The Lord is even now preparing a table for unbelieving Israel in the presence of their future enemies. It's the great end time revival happening in the Middle East right now. Millions of former Muslims, millions of Arabs and Egyptians, and again, all those nations in the Middle East, millions will they're coming to the Lord now. In Iran, huge numbers, but the numbers are going to be far beyond. But millions in the power of God, fully loyal to Jesus, fearless before death. And when Israel, unbelieving Israel, runs out of Israel, when the abomination of desolation, they flee to the mountains outside of Judea. They're running into this Islamic nations, there's millions of believers waiting for them. And the Lord has prepared a table even in the presence of their enemies. He goes, Israel, I've already got your back. I've already thought it all through and planned it ahead of time. And these, un these on fire Middle East believers, they get what's going on. The biblical narrative is pretty clear. Again, the broad strokes are pretty clear. I mean, there's lots of details we don't know. Paragraph F, the Lord told him in Ezekiel, he said, in the end times, he goes, Israel, I'm going to bring you into the wilderness of the nations. I'm going to take you outside of the land, not all the Jews, but you're going to be in the wilderness of the nations. And I believe mostly it's those Middle East nations in flight. Many will stay in the land. Many will flee the land. There's all, we'll get to that in a minute. He goes, but when I meet you in the wilderness of the nations, that's nations plural, this is mostly Middle East nations, with these on fire Middle East believers. I mean, filled with the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. The Lord says, I'm going to plead my case before you in the nations, and I'm going to bring you into the bond of covenant, which is part of your national salvation. I'm going to awaken you there. I'm going to awaken others in the land as well, but I'm going to bring many Jews that are in this difficulty to the bond of covenant, to national salvation, out right there outside the land and many inside the land. In Zechariah 12, when the house of David sees him, who they pierced, and many of them will mourn and grieve. So it's there, here, there, and everywhere, but the whole storyline is... Uh, it, it, I, I mean, it's bigger than just Jews in Israel getting saved or Jews in the Middle East. But in the wilderness of the nations, there they are. Paragraph G, here's a takeaway for us. One of the tasks of the global body of Christ, that we're just a little baby part of it, but we got to get millions on board for this. Millions, I don't mean we have to. That's, I mean, we, the body of Christ, have to. We need to encourage Arab believers, we need to tell them. I got a lot of friends, believers in Egypt. And they, don't, they don't like this Israel thing. They go, we love Jesus. And we like IHOP. I've talked to a number of leaders, but we don't like your, this Israel. That's ugh. I go, no, <laughs> no you, you got to do the biblical view of Israel. We have to encourage Arab believers to support each other. Because, you know, some come from nations that are in animosity, you know, Sunni and Shiite nations. I mean, the Arab nations don't like each other. Many of them don't. And when they get born again, they got to get reconciled together with their national hostilities. Then they got to stand together for Israel. But then we've got to, we, I don't mean here, just us. I'm talking about the global body of Christ. We got to encourage the Messianic believers to see the value of the Arab believers. You got to stand with them too. That's one of our takeaways. Paragraph H, God's going to heal the family of Abraham and the epicenter of it right there for the whole earth to see the glory of it, the Middle East. They will see people as one as the Father and the Son, and they will say the God of Israel sent Jesus of Nazareth, and the God of Israel loves them like he loves Jesus of Nazareth. That's John 17, 23. That's a remarkable passage if you take it at face value, which we do. 
Jesus talked about in John 13 to 17. We'll get to this in our Friday night and our 730 classes in this next month. He talked about a time coming. What happened in their day as well. But there's a time coming, he says, where people who kill you think they're serving God. That's Islamic terrorists. I mean, in Jesus' day, they killed the believers because they thought they were serving God. But today, the Islamic terrorists, they kill themselves to kill the believers. That's how much they believe it. Like, that's a whole nother level. I don't know anybody in the ancient world that killed themselves killing believers. It's a whole nother level of rage and deception. Jesus talked about it. This hostility. I really want you to catch this. These next is a real simple this hostility of them wanting to kill Jews and Christians is going to create the global theater for two realities, greater love and greater works. Jesus said right there, we know the passage. And he was talking about himself, but he was talking about much more than himself. He said, greater love hath no man than this. He could prophesy to the end of the age. He goes, Middle East believers, when you lay your life down protecting them, there will be no greater witness of love for them than this. This will shock them. Just like my love shocks you. There's a greater love coming, and there's a greater works coming. And it's interesting that the greater works, that is a prophecy of the end time church. I mean, there's been some miracles through history that have been outstanding, but nothing of the level where anybody could talk about any kind of consistent greater works. I believe Jesus here in John 14 is actually making reference to Micah 7 verse 15. In Micah 7 verse 15, the prophet Micah talking about the end times, he goes, I want you to know this. The miracles that were done in Egypt with Moses, they're going to happen again in the end times. Jesus knows this well. I'm telling you, the greater works and the greater love together in the fullness of the Gentiles is going to wake up unbelieving Israel to their love of the God of Israel. Top of page five. Well, people get confused. I've been in so many discussions. I mean, in the last two, three years, but over 30 years, what, oh, however many years it is, I don't know. You know, what's the real situation? And I have seven situations that I've seen from the scripture, meaning there's not one. There's at least seven. There could be a few more that I'm missing. When God's refining Israel, number one, paragraph B, some will flee. Not all of them, some of them. When you tell that to some people, they go, no, Israel's not fleeing. Oh, yeah, part of Israel is. They actually are. No, Israel's taking the land. That's true, too. Israel is taking the land. Some will be taken captive. Some will be killed. Some will rebel against God in the process. Others will remain in the land supernaturally protected. Others will be anointed for ministry like the two witnesses. And others in the land under the power of God, Jewish believers in the land. Others at the very end, those final 30 days, in a really intense way, will be empowered for literal military battle and conflict. I'm not saying only in the final 30 days, but that's the... that that that. That's the pinnacle of that. There's an anointing on them in the land in warfare at the very end for battle. So when somebody picks one of those seven and dismisses the other five or six of them, I say, no, you can't do that. We've got to have a view where all seven of them fit in different ways, different beliefs. We don't know who's going to do what. But there isn't one answer. Israel stay, Israel go, Israel live, Israel die. There's all kinds of different things happening according to the Old Testament prophets. Roman numeral uh, four. I'm just going to mention this without going into detail. This is remarkable. I have five passages here. And these five passages make it abundantly clear from my point of view, if you take end time prophecy literally if you interpret it literally which we do then these passages are quite clear five passages have Israel being rescued from as refugees or prisoners from Egypt or from Assyria and remember Assyria is 14 nations in the Middle East ancient Assyria 2700 years ago is the land that 14 different Middle East nations are a part of today 
five times the prophets, different prophets, at least five, said in that day, Jews will be rescued in Egypt. Well, why are they going to be rescued? From what? Why are they in Egypt? Well, as refugees in flight and as prisoners. Different statuses. In the nations, those 14 nations of Assyria, they will be refugees in flight and some in prison waiting to die. So you read those on your own. But there is a, here's the reason you care about this. Because if it's mentioned five times again, uh, having been a student of these 150 chapters and going hard after these years, it's remarkable how few end time events have five mentions of that one event. And this idea of Jews as refugees or captives in the nations of Assyria, modern day, those 14 nations, or in Egypt, five times it's mentioned. So the Jews have fled, not all of them, many of them, and they're there. Some are being held, uh, protected by Jewish, I mean, by uh, uh, Arab believers like the Corey Tim Boom, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. They stand up and protect them. They even risk their life to provide for them. And some of those Arab believers will die, and some of them will be supernaturally protected. We just never know which is which. But others will be in prison camps. And some folks think, oh, that's just a little intense. I go, no, this is the most intense time of human history. It's way intense. Jesus said there's no time in history like it. This will surpass Nazi Germany. Not just, remember Nazi Germany, six million Jews died in the concentration camps. But what's sometimes overlooked is five million Gentiles died in them too. But what's further overlooked, 50 million Gentiles were killed in the war. I mean, this is going to be more intense than Nazi Germany. Not just the camps. I'm talking about the carnage. What happened in Europe and Asia is incredible, the carnage. The end time is far beyond that in intensity. The Antichrist is far more clever, far more powerful, and far more cruel than Adolf Hitler. And some folks go, ah, that's intense. I go, I don't think we even get the intensity. There's only one way to be ready for this. Walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, grounded in the word, connecting with he who is the resurrection, the bridegroom king, filled with joy and love together, moving in boldness of the power of God, fearless unto death. And if we die, we step across the line. And for billions of years, we have the testimony that we were counted worthy to suffer for him. That's biblical New Testament Christianity. Top of page six. But study those five passages. There's a bunch of Jews in need of deliverance in those nations. How did they get there? It's not a mystery to me. They have fled and they're refugees or they've been taken captive. And that's the, that's the place where the Lord's going to, again, the global theater. He's telling the earth, watch this. I'm going to capture them, win them, and set them on high. You watch this. Paragraph 5. God's grand family plan. I I talked about this a couple weeks ago. The divine checkmate. God intentionally, on purpose, set up this scenario. I mean, you go back to Genesis chapter 12 to 25. He set the people in place for the end time conflict to emerge. He didn't make them sin, but he knew in his foreknowledge they would sin. He told Paul, Ephesians 3, read it on your own, most of you know it. He goes, there's a mystery. A mystery means a secret plan that's not been revealed yet. He told Paul in Ephesians 3, you can read it. He said, Paul, I haven't revealed this throughout all the ages. From the beginning, I've hidden this plan. What's the plan? What's the mystery? Gentiles are going to be one family with the Jews. Like, that's not that big a mystery. Oh, yeah, that's a huge mystery. And when he goes, Paul, I want you to make this mystery known. And right now, a little bit of detail, by preaching on it, I mean, way smaller level than Paul, but I'm making the mystery known. The Lord told Paul, 
make this mystery known, this plan, make it clear. And as you go forth and millions of others and make it known, they're doing, again, we're a small version of what Paul's doing, millions of us. There was a plan from the beginning God hid from the angels. He hid it from the demons. But he's going to put it in the mouth of the church. But more than that, the church is going to walk it out, particularly the intensities of the Middle East. Not, it's not confined in the Middle East. It'll be everywhere. And the demonic principalities will see these Arab on fire believers standing fearless for the Jews that are unsaved. They don't even like them. And the demons go, what? This is in, what's going on? And God says, the love of God has prevailed over your dark plans. That's the mystery. And we've got to make it known. It's not okay for the next 10, 20 years to just say, I'm not into the Israel thing. It's time to get into Jesus' leadership. I don't, it's not the Israel thing, it's his leadership. Abraham's family is going to be healed. When Gentiles, the sons of Ishmael, Gentiles, the sons of Esau, are reconciled to the sons of Jacob. Abraham's family line is going to be healed on a global stage for the whole world to see. Well, let's go back just for a moment. Paragraph C. Abraham's first biological son. Ishmael, he's half Egyptian. And he goes on to marry an Egyptian, and they marry Egyptians, and so the family line is significantly Egyptian and then Arab. But he started off, you know, half Abraham, or, you know, however you say it. The angel of the Lord, when Hagar, uh, Hagar the handmaiden, the Egyptian handmaiden, has the baby... The angel of the Lord says, hey, I want you to know, God is going to multiply Ishmael's children. And his descendants will be millions. Like I go, Lord, you're setting up a conflict. The Lord says, yeah, I'm going to display the love of God on a global level at the end of the age. And the whole earth will see it. Watch this. I'm going to give them mighty numbers. And he says, and by the way, these Ishmael guys, verse 12, they're going to be aggressive. They're going to be hard to get along with. They're going to cause trouble fighting all the time. This is when the, the little guys just, you know, the very beginning. Genesis 16, Genesis 17, the angel says, we're going to take it up a notch. We're going to make 12 princes. We're going to make great nation out of this adversary of Israel. I'm going to make them a great nation. Paragraph D. Well, a few years go by, and now Rebecca has a baby. And there's two nations in her womb, Esau and Jacob. And Esau's offsprings are Gentiles. Jacob's mother, Rebecca, was from Syria. His grandparents, Abraham and Sarah, were from modern-day Iraq. My, my point being, Abraham's family roots are Jewish and Gentile going all the way back. It was a family affair from the beginning. Divine checkmate. This is the phrase I've used over the years. God put himself in divine checkmate. He promised Abraham. He goes, hey, I'm going to make your descendants. Forever, for millions of years, forever. The most powerful nation politically and the most influential nation spiritually. You don't have any kids yet, but they're going to be the most powerful political nation and the most spiritually effective nation in all of human history. Abraham, wow, that's amazing. Then the Lord puts himself, I'm saying this quote unquote, in a seemingly impossible situation. He takes the nation that would resist Jesus the longest, Israel, and he would make them the nation that loves Jesus the most, eventually. Isn't that interesting? He goes, you see this nation that's been resisting Jesus the longest? They will love him the most, and they will lead more nations to Jesus than any other. Watch. Watch me turn this thing around. Then he goes, I'm going to take the nation, Israel, 
that is the most hated nation on the earth, the most threatened with annihilation, I will make them the most loved nation on the earth and the most secure one on the earth forever. Watch. I'm going to flip this thing around. And no man is going to get credit. And just to really ratchet it up, I'm going to put the oil in Isaac, I'm in Ishmael and Esau's lands. I'm going to put the oil, I'm going to give them the oil. The oil has been there the whole time, but it wasn't until 1938, just before Israel became a nation in 1948, that the oil was discovered. It could have been discovered hundreds of years ago. The Lord says, no, no, I'm going to hide it. I'm going to make them billionaires beyond measure so the Gentile nations choose money over my purpose for Israel so I reveal all the nations. But I'm going to give them all the advantages. And then when against all odds, divine checkmate, I'm going to intervene and flip everything around and cause the family of Abraham, Isaac and Ishmael and their descendants, born again in Jesus, and the sons of Jacob are going to fall in love with each other because even at the pain of death, they're going to stand with each other and the earth is going to watch this thing. Paragraph F. We talked about this the other day as well. The Joel 3. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. It's like some have said over the years, they thought the valley of decision means whether you're going to receive Jesus, his forgiveness, his free gift of salvation. I mean, that is a decision, but... That's not the valley they're talking about right now. The valley of decision is God is going to require the whole body of Christ in the earth to agree with his purpose to reveal the love of the God of Israel to unbelieving Israel. He goes, I'm going to use you to do it because I want them humbled and grateful and I want you embracing each other and I want my family restored and I want it to be the testimony forever. So I'm going to set it up this way. But Israel, I mean body of Christ, you can't back down on this. You are my chosen vessels, the privileged position. Even if you die, you will stand loyal to me to show that my love is greater than death. It's more powerful than death. The whole earth, paragraph G, is going to face this valley of decision. Nobody's going to escape it. <clears throat> because when the Antichrist creates the image of the beast and the mark of the beast economic system... And the cashless, digital, electronics, all, you know, they'll be able to enforce that across the earth. The furthest away place, the little quick shop in the faraway island, you will need to be able, you will have to verify that you're standing for the right government, the Antichrist government, or you can't buy or purchase anything. It will be global. It will be everywhere. It won't just be in the Middle East. The whole earth will be in the Valley of Decision. God's word insists the church stand with God's purpose for Israel because he goes, it's the privileged position to be the vessel to break their heart with love, to overcome them in humility and, hum- I mean, with, with, gra- with gratitude. You will fall into each other's arms forever, and that will be the story that the millennial kingdom begins with. These four, five, six million Jews, I don't know how many there will be that get saved. A third of the nation will get saved, whatever that number is, five or ten million, whatever it comes to be. That's the group that starts the millennial kingdom in Israel. And the Lord says, I've got I've to work it so clearly that that five or six or ten million, they're so filled with gratitude when I make them the most powerful nation of the earth. They can't go back again. But the storyline is such to where they will be overwhelmed with love and gratitude and humility by the way it all unfolded together and the Jews and Gentiles stood together. And those five or ten million are going to be set up to be the first generation of the millennial kingdom. It's almost like the first generation into the promised land out of Egypt. That first generation is critical and this plan is setting up that nation for success. So they never stumble again in pride with the superior blessing of God coming on them. Standing for Israel is a litmus test of God's obedience to Jesus' leadership. Like some person says, well, I'm not really into Israel. I go, well, actually, I'm not either. I'm not into the end times. I'm not either. I'm into Jesus. I love his leadership. If he wants the end times story, I'm into end times then. If he wants Israel, I'm into Israel. I'm into who, who he's into. So it's not like I pick one nation over another or one storyline. I like him. I love his leadership. 
And he's watching and he's delighted when his people love his leadership. That's why I'm into what's ever in the book. I don't like some of it. But I go, Lord, I'm dumb. You're smart. I know I will like it when it's over. But I'm just telling you now, I don't like it. But I like you and I trust you. The last sentence, the consequences. This is end with this. Critical. The consequences of the church today. Millions. Not training their people, millions of believers, I mean of leaders, not training their people what the Bible says about the end time purpose of God for Israel. God's end time purpose is going to leave, leave their children and grandchildren utterly unprepared with no biblical foundation to stand in that day. They will look at, I don't know, I'm not into the Israel thing and they will cave in or I don't know if they will, but they will certainly be far more vulnerable too. Uh, my passion is I want our children and grandchildren I'm talking about millions around the earth trained in the biblical narrative so that they have a boldness to stand because they know it matters to Jesus and they see the love of Jesus in it and they see the privilege in it and they see that God's doing this thing in the Middle East and he's preparing that first five or ten million Jews of that, you know, that inaugural generation to begin the millennial kingdom to where they will never fall back in pride ever again. The only generation that didn't stumble after a long period of time, and they'll live many long years, you know, in the millennial kingdom, though the life will be extended, and they won't be touched by money or pride or any of that in a negative way. They will be loyal to Jesus to the end. And I go, Lord, I want to be part of that. But we want our children to understand this. So they're not in that day going, uh, I'm going to get in trouble if I don't stand against Israel. Because they're going to make you be vocal. They're going to make everyone take a stand. The valley of decision. No one's going to escape this. So, Father, we say we thank you for the word of God. We love the word of God. We love your leadership. Lord, we ask you to, to help us, to train us, to touch us. Lord, I ask you in this very congregation, you would raise up messengers like Paul, who you anointed to make known the mystery. That the Jews and Gentiles are standing together to the end. Lord, raise up singers, musicians, preachers, writers, podcasts, social media, all kind of drama, media. Where we make known the mystery. I ask you for that. Lord, help us. Lord, we're weak human beings like all the others. But you're worth it and your power is sufficient. We say, yes, Lord. Let's just wait on the Lord for a moment. I mean, I gave you a lot of information. Some of you, you know this stuff like the back of your hand. Others of you, this is so new. It's like, what? But there's 10 or 12 points. Just we need to be familiar with these broad strokes. Even if it takes a while to get used to it. I mean, get with some friends and have discussions, debate it, push back against whatever. If you don't see it in the Bible with your eyes and your own Bible, don't accept it. But as a people, I mean, things are ratcheting up right now. I mean, a year, two, three from now, things might be a whole nother level of intensity. I mean, who knows? But here we are, Lord. Lord, raise up messengers that make the mystery known. They make known the mystery that was hidden from ages past. Talk to the Lord. And right now I'm saying, Lord, I don't know all this stuff, but I'm in... I don't know if I agree with everything he said, but I'm in to whatever you say in the Bible. Just if you say that and you're new with this message, just say, I'm in if I can see it. Show it to me. That's what I said when Bob Jones met me 38 years ago. He goes, Israel, I go, I'm not really into Israel. He goes, oh, you will be. Trust me. I go, no, I don't think so. 
He goes, you just read the Bible and see what you come up with. I had no idea how much was in the Bible on it. So, Father, we say yes to you. And for those that have already said yes, I ask for a spirit of revelation. I ask for a spirit of dreams and visions, prophetic revelation that are weighty, that have impartation, that have revelatory knowledge in them, that it honors the written word of God. Jesus name. Amen and amen. So we're going to end with that. Typically, I don't want to do our messages on these Friday night things. I really I want us to have more interaction, but I just felt like I there's you got to get the A to Z of this to walk away with it. And so uh you know, I want to you got it now. And now we can break it into small pieces and have all kinds of smaller discussions about it and this and that. Go ahead and and feel free to be dismissed. We have coffee over there and and uh, 7.30 is the Encounter God service. So Benji, are you in all the way? <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs>